Okay, so welcome everybody. And before I introduce um, Benny to you, I just want to say welcome to the seminars. We're honored that Benny Morris is here with us. And as many of you know, uh, we have regular seminars on Mondays and Wednesdays. On Wednesday, we have Eli uh, Vinokur, who's a professor in Haifa University. He runs a research center in Haifa on anti-Semitism. On June the 1st, next Monday, we have Natan Sharansky, who's the chair of ISGAP. It's an honor that he's coming to join us. Um, we also have David Bodine and Arnon Gro Gross, who will speak about UNRWA and uh, issues of uh, education in the, in the uh, UNRWA and in the Palestinian Authority. Uh, we also have Dina Parat, who will be speaking on the 8th of June, and Jacques Gauthier, a uh, scholar, from Toronto and Geneva, who will be speaking about Jerusalem. Um, so we have a good lineup coming up in the future. So today we have a special recurring guest to, to ISGAP, Professor Benny Morris. Uh, Benny is going to speak today about jihadism in 1948. Benny is from the Department of History and Middle East Studies at Ben Gurion University. He's currently a professor emeritus uh, at Ben Gurion. He's published many important books on the history of Zionism and the Arab conflict. And he's also contributed uh, articles and book reviews in the New York Times, the New Republic, the Guardian in London, and media throughout the world. Um, he used to be a, a writer for the Jerusalem Post before he went into academia. And he also has an important book um, that he co-wrote with Dror Zaevi, which is entitled 30 Years of Genocide, Turkey's destruction and its Christian minorities from 1840, sorry, from 1894 to 1924. It's a very important book. It was published last year and it's coming out in Hebrew in the next uh, short period of time. Uh, so Benny is uh, an old friend and colleague. He comes every year to our summer institute at Oxford to present. And it's an honor to have Benny. And Benny is, I think, w one of the few scholars who really, in my humble opinion, has a, a very strong commitment for searching for truth, uh, regardless of the ideology and the politics that kind of interfere with his academic freedom. And I think uh, he's been known for looking at the Palestinian refugee problem in a critical way, particularly for an Israeli scholar. And I think in recent years, also looking at political Islam and notions of jihadism, also in a very critical manner and not always pleasing everybody, but his scholarship is at the highest level. So Benny, it's really an honor that you're here with us and you'll be speaking about jihadism in 1948. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk a little about uh, the 1948 uh, war, the first war between Israel and the Arabs. I'll talk a, few, a little bit in an introductory fashion and then I'll talk a little bit about jihadism uh, in that war, what, what its importance was in that war, and uh, we can then open the, the field for questions. Um, the 1948 war was the culmination of about 70 years of a struggle and conflict between uh, the Arabs who lived in Palestine um, uh, and the Jews who began coming in small numbers, but then growingly in larger numbers um, from the 1880s on, uh, began to settle in Palestine as part of the Zionist vision, as part of the Zionist uh, enterprise. Uh, the idea of the settlers being to settle in the country and establish a Jewish state there in the place where a Jewish state had existed 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Um, uh, the Arabs in Palestine uh, resented this influx and gradually uh, developed a political consciousness and then resistance uh, to this settlement enterprise. And this resistance culminated in the 1948 war. Um, the immediate trigger of the war was a resolution by the United Nations uh, General Assembly, uh, essentially expressing the will of the international community uh, to partition Palestine between its Jewish, incoming Jewish settlers and the Arabs who lived there. In other words, to establish two states in a divided Palestine. It would be 
territorially, physically divided politically into two states. Um, the Palestine Arabs, uh, th this, this was voted in the United Nations on the 29th of November 1947, and the Palestine Arabs, uh, supported by all the Arab states, rejected this resolution, and the Palestine Arabs, the Arabs living in Palestine, began shooting at the Jews in an effort uh, essentially to stymie the in implementation of this resolution, to uh, uh, stymie, to torpedo uh, the possibility of a compromise a solution based on two states. Uh, the uh, Zionist militias led by the Haganah essentially beat the Palestinian Arab militias uh, in a five month long struggle. It ended in May 1948 with Jewish victory. The Palestinian Arab militias were crushed. Uh, and then the Arab states on the 15th of May invaded the, uh, the country, Palestine, and attacked Israel um, in order to. Uh, they said to save their Arab brothers, but also, in effect, to crush the uh, emergent Jewish state. Um, and that uh, invasion uh, was eventually uh, curbed and then rolled back, and Israel beat the Arab states' armies, the armies of Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and Jordan. Uh, and by January 1949, uh, Israel had emerged victorious from the struggle. The state of Israel had been declared the day before, in fact, the Arab invasion on the 14th of May, 1948. Um, and uh, that was the end of the war. So the war had these two parts, Palestinian, uh, Palestinian Arabs versus Palestinian Jews in the first half, that was a civil war. And then from May, 1948 on, a war between the newborn state of Israel and the Arab states who had attacked it, uh, as I say, ending in a Jewish victory and the, the, the consolidation of the Jewish state. Now, there have been the, the traditional view of this war by historians was that it was really a political territorial war between two national groups, two national movements, the Jewish national movement, if you like, Zionism, and the Arab, Palestinian Arab national movement backed by the Arab states. Um, uh, uh, and and uh, it was a territorial war basically about uh, um, the land. Um, from the Arab point of view, it was a war over the whole of Palestine because the Palestinian Arabs and the Arab states said no to the compromise and said they wanted all of Palestine. All of Palestine belongs to the Arabs. The Jews had accepted the partition resolution and were willing to make do with about half the country. Um, but as I said, the Arabs rejected this and went to war. But th this was the traditional view of uh, uh, the nature of the war, that it was a political struggle uh, over territory between two national movements. My reading of the documentation over the past years, uh, uh, leading to the publication of my book, 1948, A History of the First Arab-Israeli War, the book came out in 2008 um, at, with Yale University Press. My reading of the documents showed that it wasn't just a political national war over territory, which it also was, but a war also of cultures um, with a religious dimension from the Arab side. From the Arab side, the participants, the soldiers, uh, the generals, um, the political leaders understood that this was also a cultural religious struggle. Um, in other words, a holy war from the Arab side, because they're the, they're the ones who initiated the war, both in its civil war part and in its uh, a, a conventional war part. It was seen also as a, re a religious struggle, a uh, holy war, jihad, what the Arabs call jihad. Um, why did I reach this conclusion? There was also in part a, a religious war on the Arab side. On the Jewish side, it wasn't a religious war because the Jews in Palestine essentially were non-religious or even anti-religious. Uh, today, of course, there's lots of religious Jews in Israel, and they have a lot of uh, political power, and you hear them often and see them often. But in 1948, the number of the percentage of Jews who were religious in the country was less than 10 percent. The ultra-Orthodox, uh, who you see very often now on television, were less than one percent of the Jewish population of Palestine. The country was essentially controlled by the socialist parties, mainly the main socialist party, Mapai and uh, Mapam. Uh, the more extreme, if you like, socialist party, 
they did not believe in religion, they didn't believe in God, they had rebelled essentially against the God of their forefathers, and they wanted to establish a socialist a secular state in Israel, which is what was established in 1948. They didn't regard the war in any way as a religious struggle. On the Arab side, um, the Arabs were believers. Most of them were believers, probably 99.9%, um, as is incidentally is still true in the Arab world. There's a great deal of belief there as compared, say, to the West, where the, the existence of God and the God's desires, etc., are not usually taken into consideration by the, the uh, population. But in the Arab world, this isn't the case. Certainly, it wasn't the case in 1948. And the war, from their point of view, was a, a seen as also a religious war. Now, wh what do we see in the documentations that indicates this? Well, I can only give you illustrations. There weren't popular opinion polls. People didn't go and check with the soldiers or the citizenry in polls. What do you think? Are you fighting a religious war? They didn't actually go and ask the generals or the colonels or the, the civilian uh, leaders, uh, what were you fighting about uh, uh, in terms of you know, uh, opinion polls, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but there's a, enough uh, illustrative material in the documentation which exists to show that there was this large religious element as a motivating factor on the Arab side. In January 1948, now I'll give you a couple of illustrations. In January 1948, a woman called Matiel Muranam, who was the leader, who was actually a Lebanese Christian woman who had married a Muslim in Jerusalem and then moved from Lebanon to Palestine, to Jerusalem, um, and became the head of the Palestine Women's Organization, which was a small organization, an adjunct of the Arab Higher Exe Committee, which was the executive of the Palestine Arab National Movement. In other words, the national movement of the Palestine Arabs, led by Haj Amin al husseini had a small women's branch called the Women's Organization, and was headed by this Lebanese Christian woman who had moved to uh, Palestine. And she was interviewed in January 1948, just at the very beginning, if you like, of the Civil War part of the 1948 war. And what she told her interviewers was this. The UN partition decision of 29 November 1947 has united all Arabs as they have never been united before, not even against the Crusaders. A Jewish state has no chance to survive now that the holy war has been declared. All the Jews will eventually be massacred. Uh, now, this is a Christian woman uh, living in Palestine and sort of understanding what the sense, what the feeling is among Palestine's Arabs at the time, which was, as I said, holy war. Um, in May 1948, when the Saudis, Saudi Arabia, uh, decided to join the war which the Arab states had just launched against the new state of Israel, May 1948, the Saudis uh, uh, had festivals, jihadi festivals, around the country, around Saudi Arabia, where they were trying to mobilize and sign up recruits as volunteers for this jihad in Palestine. Saudi soldiers would go off and fight in Palestine, volunteers. Uh, not that many actually showed up, uh, about maybe 2,000 registered, uh, but the, the, the Saudi leaders said uh, there were 200,000 who were ready to go. We know that we, uh, not that many eventually showed up. Uh, the war wasn't that pleasant and people probably had second thoughts. And there weren't that many uh, aircraft, you know, flying people in from Saudi Arabia. It wasn't easy to get to Palestine. Uh, we do know that hundreds came from other Arab countries, from the Maghreb especially, from Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, uh, and did fight eventually uh, because there, there was this sense there was jihad. Now, why was the why? How did the Arab world hear about, know that this was going to be a jihad, that this was a religious crusade? Well, on the 1st of December, 1947, three days after the UN resolution had passed, two or three days after the Arabs began, the Arabs of Palestine began shooting at the Jews in Palestine, a, a triggering, a starting the a 1948 war. Um, on the 1st of December, Al-Azhar University's ulama, that is the Council of Wise Men, the Council of Theologians of Al-Azhar University in Cairo, which is the leading in, in, in the oldest Arab university, and also the, the Council of Theologians is considered the major authority 
um, uh, in the Muslim Sunni world. The Sunni world, the Sunnis are the largest part of Islam, the Shias are the smaller part. Uh, in the Sunni world, there is no pope, there's no one authority, but there is one supreme authority uh, if you count all the different uh, ca capitals in Sunni Islam, and that is Al Azhar's University's ulama, the Council of Theologians. On the 1st of December, this Council of Theologians issued a fatwa, a religious uh, edict, a, re a religious uh, a ruling, uh, calling on the world's Muslims to join in the jihad in Palestine against the Zionist enterprise, to crush the Zionist enterprise. Come if you can, if you're adult and, and in good condition, come and fight. If you can't come and fight, at least contribute money, give rings, give sheep, give whatever you can for this uh, battle in Palestine. So they issued a call to the Muslim world uh, to engage, to launch a jihad in Palestine against uh, the Zionists. Um, the interesting thing is that, one second, there's a telephone. Huh? The interesting thing is that this call for jihad, even though it actually didn't trigger that many volunteers, this call for jihad was reissued by the ulama of Al Azhar in April 1948. In other words, towards the end of the civil war, by which time the Palestine Arabs had essentially lost the civil war part of the war and the Arab states were just mobilizing to invade themselves the following month in May, El Azhar, the ulama, reissued this edict, this call for jihad in Palestine. One can assume that what they were trying to do when they issued it towards the end of April was to force or push their government, the government of Egypt and all the governments of the Arab world to actually go and invade Palestine as they were to do two weeks later. It wasn't clear they were gonna do it and they probably needed this little extra push. And so the people, the ulama uh, of al Hazar thought and so they issued this call. Now, um, one can assume this had some impact on the Arab leaders, especially the leaders in Egypt. They did actually join the war, they sent their troops across the border, attacked the Jewish state unsuccessfully. But the ulama of Al-Azhar reissued this uh, ruling, this fatwa, again in December 1948. By December 1948, the Arab world had lost the war. The Arab states had been defeated by the Jews. And yet the Al-Azhar's uh, ulama reissued the call for jihad, for holy war, in December 1948 after the Arabs had lost the war. What they were doing, in fact, was saying to the Arab states, the Arab leaders, the Arab world in general, well, we've lost this round in the battle against the Jews, but we want to restart it. We intend to restart it. We call on you to restart jihad. Remember, you've got to do this. This is God's command. You've got to do this uh, down the road again. And so they reissued this call for jihad in December 48, when it was no, no, no longer relevant in terms of the 48 war, which the Arab world had just lost. Um, there is a methodological problem, and this I'll just finish with this, um, in defining what motivated Arab soldiers, what motivated officers in the Arab world and Arab armies, what motivated the politicians when they actually went to war against the Jews in Palestine. And this is, of course, because there was no democracy in any of the Arab states, as, of course, there is none now. Um, and uh, so public opinion wasn't really gauged properly. Um, there weren't opinion polls. Newspapers were not free. So they didn't express political views of various parties and various people. They expressed what the state or the leading party uh, in the state wanted. Uh, so it's difficult to gauge how many Arabs actually thought in terms of jihad as they went to fight or as they contributed their dollars or rings or whatever uh, uh, to, to fund the fight. Uh, we don't really know what they had in their hearts, but we do have these impressionistic uh, um, um, illustrations uh, of what uh, drove them. Uh, we know that, for instance, King Farouk of Egypt meeting a British diplomat uh, a few weeks into the Arab invasion in May 1948, he tells the British diplomat, I can't, can't do any, anything else. I couldn't not invade. I had to invade because the street, the, 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 the Arab street in Cairo and Alexandria 
in my country was pushing us with religious fervor to go to war. In other words, they wanted jihad, and I, King Farouk of Egypt, had no choice but to follow their wishes and to send my troops into battle. Um, um, so as I say, there is a problem in, in, in defining what exactly motivated, but we have enough illustration uh, to show that jihadism certainly was in the minds of uh, uh, the Arab leaders uh, and the Arab public in various places. We can see that um, as a motivating factor in the war, probably alongside political nationalist considerations as well. And yeah, that's all I wanted to say as an introduction, and please um, feel free to ask what you like. Okay. Benny, thank you very much for your presentation, and people are already beginning to send me questions. So those of you who are listening, you're very welcome to send me questions, and I'll pass on as many comments and questions to Benny as possible. So I, I'm going to start off the a question with how you ended your presentation. And you were saying how there's sort of bits and pieces of information that gives indication that some of the, um, the attacks on Israel or the creation of the state of Israel was, was, um, was based on jihadist uh, sentiment or kind of religious fervor. Um, but I would like to change the question around a bit and ask you, um, in the academic world, I would argue there was a bit of a blind spot in recognizing and understanding the, the influence of of religion and jihad on the opposition to the state of Israel. Because in a sense, we, we viewed international relations and, and academia from sort of a Western gaze of nationalism and land. And I think as scholars in general, I'm making sweeping generalizations, so forgive me, but we paid less attention to these sort, sort of issues of, of the impact of religion on the, on the conflicts in, in the region. So I was thinking, your work in 1988, the birth of the Palestinian refugee uh, problem, and your later work in 1999 um, on the righteous victims of the, the refugees as righteous victims, w was your scholarship in? Were you aware of the of the importance of jihad in kind of the the bordering region and the the politics that uh, religion played in rejecting? The existence of Israel, that the Muslim Brotherhood and that ideology was more important than we as scholars gave credit for it. Has your gaze changed over the decades in, in on this? Well, that, that's question? an interesting question. Yeah, I, I think it has. It, it did change a bit. I think it probably changed a little under the impact of current uh, events in the early 21st century, starting, if you like, with 9/11 uh, and the importance of the 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 uh, extremists, uh, the jihadists, the fundamentalists in moving uh, the politics in the Middle East. Uh, I'm sure that affected it, and some people will, will probably argue that this affected my view too much as to the past, but I think I got it more or less right. You have to find the right balance between uh, what affects you currently and really what the documents tell you, and I think I, I basically went with what the documents told me. It's true that in the 1980s and early 1990s, I wasn't fully aware of how important religious sentiment was in the struggle against uh, the Jewish state in uh, Palestine's Israel. Um, and I only became aware of it as I was researching my book, Righteous Victims, which came out in 1999, which is a history of the Israeli-Arab conflict from the start until 1999, from the 1880s until 1999. And I went over the literature over the uh, seven, eight decades, uh, nine decades, which it covered, and, and I saw that religion kept coming up in, in, in the, the rhetoric and in the um, motivation, at least declared, of the actors at various points in time in the struggle before 1948 and after 1948. And when I researched uh, the, uh, in the early 2000s, the book which came out in 2008, 1948, I again saw that uh, there was uh, enough evidence to uh, make the point I was making that a, a religious sentiment, jihadism, was a major element in the Arab assault on uh, Israel. It wasn't a side thing. Now, it's true that in the Arab world, there isn't that much distinction or separation between church and state. And um, uh, the language of 
religion often is used by politicians uh, in terms of their rhetoric, not necessarily because it's heartfelt religious sentiment, because that's the way you speak. When, uh, when President Sadat of Egypt, for example, beginning his peace process with Israel in 1977, showed up in the Knesset in the Israeli parliament and uh, orated his uh, famous speech, uh, which most of the Arab world regarded as treacherous, that he was willing to make peace with Israel if Israel withdrew from Sinai, etc. Um, uh, he began his speech by saying, Bism al-Allah, in the name of Allah, in the name of God, and here is what I'm telling you. And this is a sort of a, a manner of speaking, which is normal in the Arab world, um, except that, of course, in Sadat's case, and I think in the case of many Arabs, when they say that, they mean it, because Sadat was an extremely religious person. So when he said, I'm speaking in the name of Allah, etc., etc., this is what I want, I think he meant it. It wasn't just politics, it was also religion in his mind as motivating him towards making peace with Israel for whatever reasons. We can go into that. Why did he make peace with Israel? Um, it's an interesting subject, but, but I think he also thought in terms of religion that is, uh, Islam, like all religions, has good sides and bad sides, and it has a good side which seeks uh, peace with other people, with other religions, and this is what he was expressing. So what I'm saying is there is a problem in, in the Arab world in distinguishing between what is mere rhetoric and what is heartfelt sentiment, but I think that there's enough evidence to show that heartfelt sentiment was there. And it's true that I came to this a bit late because I hadn't actually looked for certain things. And here, perhaps under the impact of what was happening in the West and in the Arab world in the early 2000s, 9-11, et cetera, it sort of jumped out at me and said, well, it's already there. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank, thanks, Benny. So there, we have uh, many questions, so I'll try to get to as many as possible. Deborah Glazer would like to ask you a question. And she writes, um, I would like you to comment on the film 1948, Creation and uh, Catastrophe. Uh, Catastrophe. In our minds, this film is a very skillful presentation of anti-Israel propaganda masquerading as objective documentary. It features Israeli and Arab voices on the Nakba events of 1948 and includes a short interview with eyewitnesses from both sides and with academics, including you, Benny. Here, and then she gives me the link. The film has been shown in many US campuses and in and Palestinian film festivals and by other critics of Israel's right to exist. We, we, they attended, uh, she attended with, with her family a showing of a film last year at the University of California at Irvine, and that her impression, uh, she wrote her, imp her impressions in an article published in the Jewish Journal in Los Angeles. In my opinion, it would be helpful for Professor Morris to comment on the film as a whole. Have you seen it? And how do you, how do you feel that your comments were portrayed in the film? I'm not sure that I've seen it. I, I probably have and I can't remember because I've seen a number of films on the subject and they're probably all um, a, a mash in my mind. But, but um, um, look, when you interview for a film, you don't know what the film is actually going to look like. In fact, the most important person in the documentary I've discovered is the editor, not even the producer and director and the people who speak, but the editor, who, he's the guy who puts it together and then you have different weights for different things and how many minutes each person gets and what, what arguments uh, actually uh, uh, are enunciated, etc. cetera. Uh, so when you are interviewed for a film, you don't really know what they're going to do with it uh, and they can even cut up what you say. I did myself take part in a film and had a hand in producing it in a sense because I wrote uh, the script, a movie called Nak the, uh, uh, the Nakba, uh, produced by a man and directed by a man called Benny Bruner, who also did the same thing. We looked at what, why the Palestinians, a, a large number of Palestinians became what were called refugees, about 700,000 during the 1948 war. Um, we interviewed various people. I did some of the interviews myself. Uh, I spoke uh, in, in the film as well. We interviewed people on the Jewish side, on the Arab side, etc. And I think it gives a fairly reasonable, uh, objective look at what happened, why it happened, how it happened, etc. Uh, but one can, of course, always look at various segments of the film and say, this works in favor of Arab propaganda. Or the Arabs will say that segment works in favor of Jewish propaganda. Uh, so yeah, well, what really is required is for people to learn a bit about the history so that when they see these movies, they'll know who's telling the truth or who's telling what's important in what happened and who's sort of trying to sideline you 
with some a propaganda point. Yeah, thanks, Benny. So uh, Harold Rowan would like to uh, ask you a question. He said that uh, Yasser Arafat once told President Carter that if he recognized Israel and ended the war, he would suffer the same fate as Sadat. He meant that Sadat, that Sadat recognized Israel, which is basically against Islam, and he paid the ultimate price with his murder. That is why Arafat said, I will not have tea with Sadat. Could you comment on that? Well, we know that, that Arafat joined the Israeli-American-Palestinian peace process uh, called the Oslo process and eventually in some way uh, even agreed to recognize um, uh, Israel um, in return for Israeli recognition of the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people. Um, we also know that when it came to the crunch at the end of the Oslo process after seven years of negotiations between 1993 and 2000, that process culminated in something called the Camp David Summit, attended by Arafat for the Palestinians, um, Bill Clinton for the Americans, and Ehud Barak for the Israelis. In 2000, in Camp David, he basically said no to what uh, Barak had proposed, a two-state solution, and they repeated that when the Americans even bettered their offer in terms of the Palestinians, in what are called the Clinton parameters in December 2000 and rejected the Clinton parameters as well. In other words, when it came to the crunch, he couldn't bring himself to sign a peace agreement which would end the conflict. That was the idea on the part of at least Barack and um, President Clinton. What motivated him? Well, presumably he also had this idea at the back of his mind that if you sign an agreement with Israel, you're likely to end up being killed in the Arab world as had happened to Sadat and as incidentally had happened to the King of Jordan, Abdullah, in 1951, who had begun a peace process with Israel, he was also assassinated by extremist Palestinian gunmen. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is it's possible, possibly, he was <coughs> incapable constitutionally, having called for Israel's destruction for 40 years of his, uh, 50 years of his earlier life. Here he was being asked to make peace with the Jewish state, I don't think he had, he had it in him. Uh, he was also a religious person. I think maybe he was motivated as well by uh, his Islamic belief that this was holy Isra Islamic territory, Palestine, and should not be given up any part of it for a Jewish state in a so-called uh, compromised territorial uh, you know, solution. <laughs> so so what, what I'm saying is he may have been driven from uh, per, by personal fears. He may also have been driven by internal uh, ideology, something he really believed in, that the Jewish state was uh, bad, it was uh, wrong, it was against God's will, and that he couldn't sign himself, uh, he couldn't sign an agreement on that basis. And do, do you think Abbas is in the same sort of position as Arafat? Or is he I think different? Abbas is a less religious person and has shown a certain amount of courage over the years in, for example, resisting terrorism as a method. In other words, Arafat was a master terrorist and always used terrorism both against Israel and against other countries. Uh, Jordan, for example, where he led a revolt against King Hussein. Uh, uh, Arafat thought terrorism was a useful and good weapon uh, in the struggle for uh, his people's rights. I think Abbas has always publicly rejected terrorism. On the other hand, he's never actually also himself agreed to a two-state solution. He, Abbas, was presented with a two-state solution in 2007-2008 by uh, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. And uh, when the actual map was put on the table, uh, you know, he would get the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and part of Jerusalem. He said no. He, in other words, he didn't agree. He didn't actually even say the word no. He simply didn't respond. And then Ehud Olmert was re removed from office a few months later. And that was the end of that peace initiative. So what I'm saying is Abbas, seemingly a more a moderate character, a seemingly a more conciliatory, when it came down to it, he also did not sign, a, a, a wouldn't sign on the dotted line for a two-state agreement. Okay, thank you. Alec uh, Bobro asks, uh, in his book, Ari Shavit seems to place a great deal of uh, emphasis on the early displacement of local populations as a reason for the refusal of Arabs to accept Israel. Do you agree with uh, Shavit's perspective on this? 
Yeah, if we're talking about if we're talking about um, 1948, when 700,000 out of 1.2 million Palestinians were uprooted from their homes and became what is called refugees, this has certainly weighed heavily on Palestinian minds and on the Arab world in general, uh, um, when especially when it's viewed as a expulsion, a premeditated expulsion by Israel of these poor, unfortunate people, and uh, therefore Israel is criminalized, and therefore you don't make peace with Israel. Um, uh, when you see it from that perspective, um, uh, it certainly is an impediment to making peace with Israel. My view of what happened is a little more complex, and it basically says uh, the Arabs started the war in 1947 and then repeated their uh, initiation of the war in May 1948 when the Arab states invaded, and this is what produced um, the large refugee population um, and caused the refugee problem to come into existence. So the Arabs share a part of the responsibility, in my view. But, but as I say, uh, this is weighed over uh, on the Arab minds for the past 70 years among Palestinians for sure, but also among Arabs outside and has made it more difficult for them to make peace with their Israel, to accept Israel as a legitimate presence. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, thank you. So, in light of this, how do you, uh, Joseph Flashner, uh, states that you don't really speak about much of the Mizrahi Jews or Jews of the region that were expelled from Arab countries. So, in the context of 1948 and jihad uh, and the expulsion of Palestinian refugees, how do you see uh, Mizrahi Jews or Jews from the region that were dispelled? from their homelands at uh, relatively similar numbers? Well, firstly, it's true that as a result of the 1948 war, the Jewish communities in the Arab lands all vanished and left their countries, most of them, most of these Arab Jews, as they were called, moving to Israel. And the same numbers, more or less, as Palestinians were uprooted, seven to 800,000 of them ended up in Israel. So there was, in a sense, an exchange of population. Palestinians left their homes and lands in Palestine, which became Israel. And Arab Jews, Jews in Baghdad, in Sana'a, in, uh, in Damascus, in, uh, in Morocco, in Algeria, in Tunisia, all of these were um, uh, essentially uprooted uh, and uh, left those countries, also leaving vast uh, amounts of wealth behind. Uh, and there was a sort of an exchange of population. But it's not exactly the same. Um, I, firstly, it requires a separate study, and there have been studies of what happened. But to begin with, the Arabs um, did not expel most of these Jews. There were only expulsions in Egypt in 1956 of Jews. Most of the Jews left Arab lands. We're talking about Yemen, we're talking about Iraq, and then afterwards, uh, uh, Egypt and uh, Syria and uh, in North Africa, they left these countries uh, as a result of intimidation by the governments and by the societies amid whom they lived, but not by acts of expulsion by the state. It's not exactly the same thing. Whereas what happened in Palestine wasn't exactly an expulsion either because most people fled their homes as a result of battle, not because they were forcibly evicted from their homes, but they were not allowed to return to their homes in the Palestinian Arabs who became refugees. From 1948, Israel would not allow a mass refugee return. Essentially said, refugees will not return. Uh, on the other hand, the Jews from Arab lands never had a wish to return. So there's an asymmetry there. Jews from Arab lands don't want to go back to Morocco or Damascus or, or Yemen or any other God-forsaken place, most of which are in battle today uh, and live terrible lives, the people there. Uh, Jews don't want to go back there, whereas Palestinian Arabs who've remained refugees in the, in the various uh, countries surrounding Israel, as well as, as well as in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, they, don't, they want to go back to their homes. There's a, an asymmetry there, but it, in the, the fact that one deals with the creation of the refugee problem, does, uh, the Palestinian refugee problem, doesn't necessitate dealing with and writing about the uh, creation of Jewish refugees from Arab countries. Uh, these are two separate issues, even though they were both caused by the same war, ultimately. Okay, thanks, Benny. So we've never done this before. We're going to have Zoom history, maybe. So Natan Sharansky would like to ask you a question through the audio. So if Ira, if you're able to patch him in and allow him to ask a question live, that would be great. Uh, 
Thank you, Ira. So Natan, I think you have to unmute your, your uh, computer and then you can ask the question. Uh, okay, Natan, if you could unmute the, the, your microphone, we'll be able to, I'll be able to okay. see it. Oh, there you go. Good. Do, can you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you. I can hear, I can ah, okay. hear you. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Professor Benny. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, very interesting for me uh, to hear it from you. And of course, I read uh, some, at least some of what you wrote. And what's more important, I also, is what some of those who were asking the question, spent a lot of time on campuses. And I know how all this Nagba thing uh, is used uh, for delegitimization uh, of Israel. So uh, did, do, did, do I understand you correctly now that uh, looking back and taking into account the experience with funda Muslim fundamentalism in Europe and America in the last 20 years, you think that even if uh, uh, somehow Arab League will vote to accept the idea or to recognize United Nations resolution. In fact, the fundamentalist uh, denial of the right of Jews to have part of the sacred Muslim lands would not permit uh, implementation of this resolution. Uh, how you, in terms, was there any other option at that moment except of denial of the United Nations decision by Muslim law? Well, if we're talking about 1947-48, uh, yeah. I don't think the Arab world and the Arab leaders were capable at the time of accepting a two-state solution. In other words, accepting the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine uh, on half or 55% of Palestine as uh, the United Nations General Assembly had recommended. Uh, they weren't capable of doing that. And it wasn't just a matter of fundamentalist Islam or Islamic thinking, though that certainly helped to drive this rejectionism, they also thought that it was unjust that the Jews were going to be given a, a chunk of land on which Arabs had lived for the past hundreds of years. Uh, they thought this was unjust. You can say, we can say, the Jews can say, we once owned this land. This land was the Jewish state 2,000 years ago, but the Arabs said, what does, what does, Hey, what happened here 2,000 years ago, even if it's true, and they deny it today, but even if they accept that there was a Jewish presence in the land from 1,000 BC until 135 AD, eh, eh, what has this got to do with what's happening in the 20th century when most of the people on the land are Arabs and Jews are coming in and want half of the land? Eh, from, from their point of view, it didn't make any um, eh, sense in terms of, the, of justice as they saw it. You have to get into the shoes of the Jews and people who accept Jewish history and look at what had happened to the Jews in the 20th century, including the Holocaust, to be able to justify what happened. But if you don't do that, uh, Arabs find that very difficult to uh, understand. Okay, but now there are... Let's about say, 1947. Okay, the, 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 let's take now three generations after this, in today's world. Uh, uh, does Arab world or big parts of Arab world are really ready to accept whether it is just or not, but we accept that Israel uh, should, uh, has the right and should exist as a part of the Middle East? <laughs> I could talk about this for hours and it's a, this is a really difficult question. Firstly, one has to take account of the rise of fundamentalism in the Arab world. That is, many more Arabs are much more uh, uh, engaged and angry and motivated by religion than was the case in 1948. They're more politically conscious. So this is a factor. The second factor, which works in the opposite direction, is that Israel did come into existence, exists, and there are 7 million Jews living in Palestine, Israel today, uh, and so it's unrealistic in some way to say, well, let's go to war and kick them out and not give them any rights or murder 7 million people. Uh, some Arabs will say, well, even if it's unjust that the Jewish state was created, uh, 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 destroying 7 million people will be even more unjust. Um, and, and therefore you can't reverse the wheel of history. 
So I'm saying there's different uh, things working in different directions. A rise of fundamentalism means less willingness to accept the Jewish state, but the existence of the state and the reality of 7 million people living here with nowhere else probably to go uh, motivates people to say, well, even if it's unjust, we'll accept what happened. This, in a sense, is what um, uh, Sadat did in 1978-79 when he signed uh, the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. And this is what King Hussein did uh, a decade and a half later uh, when Jordan signed the Jordanian-Israeli peace. They may not have been especially happy with Israel's existence, uh, but they said, well, this is reality and you can't just fight against reality. You have to face it and make do with what you can and make the best, uh, you know, make, make the best you can out of it. So I'll, I'd say one simple thing. I don't think that the Arab world today, the Arab publics, accept the legitimacy of the state of Israel. They never did, and they don't think they have today, and they won't in the future. It'll take a long, long time, the same as maybe it's taken the Muslim world a very long time to accept the Spanish Reconquista in Spain, to accept that Spain has become, again, a Christian country. It'll take a very long time for Arab publics to agree to that. But whether they're willing to sacrifice Egypt or Syria or Iraq to get rid of Israel, if there's like an atomic war between the sides, which will destroy Arab states, whether they're willing to pay that price to destroy Israel, probably not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Natan. Thank you. Thank you. So f sort of following up on Natan's question, Benny, for a certain period of time, it's ar arguable for how long, European leadership and certainly under the Obama administration, there was an engagement with the Muslim Brotherhood and there was an engagement with the Iranian revolutionary regime. Do you think that that engagement pushes back any prospects for peace? Does it prop up the jihadists? What do you think, what do you think Western policy- I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, I think it's too early to tell. What is certain is that the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't accept the legitimacy of the state of Israel and doesn't want peace with Israel. And the Iranian regime, which says so co uh, constantly, wants to destroy Israel or wants Israel to be wiped off the map. Whether you engage with them, will it, will it moderate their views, their desires? I don't think so. I don't think so. But it's a bit early to tell what the ultimate result of engagement with them will be. Will it just help to strengthen them or will it slowly eat away at their fundamentalism and make them more reasonable? One can't tell. It's a matter of, it's in the process. Okay, we have a question from Greg Mashberg, who's on the ISGAP board, and he asks you, does the spirit of jihad and holy war animate current Palestinian rejectionism, particularly the claim for the right of return? And assuming so, does this mean that the conflict is more intractable uh, than inter in international diplomacy or, inter the, or the international diplomatic community truly understands? I think it's more intractable than the international community understands. I think that's correct. I think fundamentalism has grown stronger in the Arab world. It's grown stronger among Palestinians, partly because of the failures of their, their previous leaderships. The Hamas is much stronger today than it was 30 or 40 years ago. In fact, if a, a, a uh, honest vote was probably was taken among Palestinians, you'd probably find that the Hamas would get um, um, more votes than the secular um, uh, parties in the Palestinian uh, uh, sphere. Uh, and this incidentally is what happened in the only Palestinian elections which were free, I think it was in 2006, the Hamas won. So, uh, and the Hamas, uh, its policy is to destroy the state of Israel and to turn all of Palestine into a Arab religious state uh, ruled by Sharia, by a uh, Muslim religious law. That's what they say they want to do. So all of this has meant that uh, it's more difficult for Palestinians who are reasonable, and there are reasonable Palestinians as well, to make peace because they have this large presence at their back or at their side, which basically has majority support among Palestinians, called the Hamas or the Islamic Jihad. So, go, Benny, going back to your current work, uh, your most recent book on uh, the 30 years of genocide, Turkey's destruction of its Christian minorities, why did you choose that subject? Was it sort of given the, the work that you were doing, did you want to go sort of further back into, I, I guess, the place of the other in Islamic society? That's the first question. And the second question, 
uh, your research is sort of pre-Muslim Brotherhood. So how did, how did you, how, do, how was the treatment of the other, of the Christians in Turkey informed by, I don't know, I guess an Islamist perspective of uh, domination? How, what were the factors, the ideological factors? Well, uh, I look, came up with? No, no, I, I went, I went uh, and proposed uh, to Dror Zevi that we write a book about what had happened to the Armenians um, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I went to him and said, let's write a book about the Armenian genocide, which was well known, except there was controversy about whether it had happened, whether it was a state organized thing or not. Um, because I basically had written too many books about the Israeli Arab conflict and was simply interested in going somewhere else. And I wanted to find a decent subject. And this was a good subject and controversial in terms of the historiography, I wanted to sort out what was what had, had actually happened myself, going through the documentation and seeing what had happened. What happened though was once we started looking, the two of us, Drawers, Evie and myself, uh, at the documentation, Israeli, not Israeli, American, British, uh, uh, Turkish, um, French, etc. Uh, he's a Turkish expert, an Ottoman expert, my co-author. Um, we discovered that really the subject wasn't only the Armenians and what had happened to them during World War I, 1915, 1916, the so-called Armenian Genocide. We discovered the subject was really more, much wider, uh, both in, uh, in terms of the, the chronology and in terms of the peoples involved. And we found that really the process had begun in, begun in 1894 and ended in 1924, and the process involved essentially the de-Christianization of the Ottoman Empire or Turkey uh, in three giant waves of violence. Um, uh, essentially, uh, initially um, directed against the Armenians in 1894-96, and then the second wave was what's called the Armenian Genocide in 1915-16, and then at the same time during World War I, and then in the years 1919-1923, under Ataturk, the third wave of violence uh, encompassed the Greek and Assyrian populations in Turkey, uh, which were larger, incidentally, than the Armenian population, though they suffered a little a smaller number of deaths. But altogether, we're talking about two, two and a half million people who were murdered by the Turks in this 30-year period as they were busy either exterminating or expelling the three Christian minorities who had lived there for hundreds of years. In fact, had predated the Ottomans in Turkey uh, by a thousand years. The Greeks had lived in the area which we call Turkey uh, around from the year uh, 1500 BC, 1000 BC, when the Greeks settled the, the Turkish coast, the coasts of Asia Minor. The Turks, today's Turks, the Ottomans, the, the, the Muslims arrived in Turkey much, much later in the 15th, 14th, 15th centuries AD. Um, so uh, we saw that the whole the process was much longer. It was 30 years longer, uh, 30 years long, and that it involved all different Christian minorities in Turkey who were ultimately expelled or destroyed. And it was carried out by three successive Turkish regimes. We're talking about the sultans, uh, Abdul Hamid, uh, the Sultanate, and then by the CUP, the Committee for Union and Progress, the Young Turks, as they were called, and then by their successor, Ataturk, who in, in, in the West was seen as a great uh, enlightened uh, European figure, but actually was just a mass murderer uh, like his predecessors when it came to his treatment of the Christian minorities. He's the one who got rid of the last of the Christians, the last of the Armenians, Greeks, and the Syrians from Turkey. Interesting. So I know while you, while you were doing your research, um... So some sort of poll just appeared. I think I think everybody who's listening is going to get a poll. So we we appreciate your feedback on the uh, program. I just got it flashed in front of my screen here. So I, I hope everybody else does too. We would like your feedback. Um, so Benny, I know when you were when you were doing your research, you were actually in Turkey for the attempted coup against Erdogan. Um, so, it so it worked out. It all worked out well. You got back safe. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. That was that was. We actually didn't do research there. We, we went to Turkey two, I think it was two summers ago, a drawer and myself, we rented a Jeep and drove from the Black Sea coast down to the Mediterranean and then back, back to the Black Sea, to Samsun. 
and from there flew to Istanbul, a sort of a 10-day tour of various sites in which, in fact, Turks had massacred Greeks and uh, Armenians and Assyrians, places we both of us had not been to in the past. And we wanted to see the lay of the land, what it looked like. But essentially, we'd written our book uh, uh, before our uh, journey. So just we wanted to see for, for our, you know, for our, uh, in our own eyes, with our own eyes, what the, what the places looked like, uh, which was an interesting tour. But as you say, it turned out that when we got to Amakia, <laughs> a large Turkish uh, city uh, in uh, central northern Turkey, uh, in the middle of the night at two o'clock, uh, people were screaming in the uh, streets and shooting, and there were big loud bangs, which afterwards it turned out were sonic booms by the, um, those who mounted the coup and had the Air Force under their control. They were uh, sort of making a lot of noise, trying to persuade the Turkish public to side with the, 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 uh, against uh, Erdogan. Uh, so <laughs> we were like two um, uh, Europeans or Israelis in the midst of this. And it, it, it felt a, a little uncomfortable, but interesting. Eventually, we got to uh, Constantinople, where the tanks were still on the bridges, tanks from which uh, uh, the population which had supported Erdogan had essentially taken out the soldiers and thrown them into the river. <laughs> so, so many, we just have a couple of more minutes left. Uh, some are arguing that Turkey, er, led by Erdogan, is now sort of taking over the mantelpiece as the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood as Qatar maybe fades away a little bit. And Erdogan is also seemingly using the refugee crisis in the region and from Syria and Iraq to uh, play rough politics with Europe. He's sort of turning the tap on and turning the tap off. In a, in a few moments, how do you see Erdogan and the Muslim Brotherhood playing politics vis-a-vis -vis Israel? Palestinians and European migration? Well, Erdogan is essentially interested in turning Turkey into a major player, uh, if you like, to resurrect the Ottoman Empire, which was a major player in European and uh, Middle Eastern politics for hundreds of years. It's a powerful state. He wants Turkey to be that powerful state again. And he happens to also be an Islamist, who therefore supports the various Islamist movements, including the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, in in the Gaza Strip and so on. And he hates Israel. He's always hated Israel. It took him a few years to begin to show that um, as he was inching towards turning Muslim, uh, turning Turkey into an Islamist Republic. Um, uh, he's, he's an enemy of Israel's. Um, I've never actually understood why Israel hasn't broken relations with Turkey. It should have, but I suppose economic, con economic considerations, I suppose, play a major role why Israel hasn't actually uh, divorced itself from Turkey, economic and perhaps some military thing. Um, but uh, my, my sense is the man is an enemy of Israel and an enemy of the West. And uh, he, the, he understands that Turkey will never be accepted in the European Union. It's not a European state. It's a Muslim uh, Islamist state. Uh, Europe doesn't need that. It has enough uh, uh, Muslim problems without uh, millions of Turks suddenly arriving in Paris. Um, so uh, he has a large amount of resentment against uh, Europe. Um, 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 and basically, we'd probably like to see the West uh, destroyed, um, that, that Israel uh, included in that West. Okay, on that note, <laughs> so Benny, we're out of time. So really, thank you very much for joining us and for your continued insights and uh, perspective. I think you elevate the work that we're doing at ISGAP uh, consistently. So thanks for joining us and taking your time. I really appreciate it. And for those listening, uh, on Wednesday, we have a, a young scholar, Eli Vinokur from Haifa University. He's going to speak. The title of his talk is Social Justice, Human Rights, Cosmopolitanism, and Their Enemies, Jewishness and the Jewish State. So he'll be here on Wednesday. So everybody... Stay well, and thank you for joining us, and I hope to see everybody on Wednesday. Take care.